Well, good afternoon, and thank you for taking part in this, the last of a series of eight. Many of you have participated right the way throughout this series of conversations on development, security, and transition. And you'll know at the end of this afternoon, there's going to be the publication or the release of the report, which I know you're, oh, it's all sitting on your chairs, so there you go. Um, please don't um, pour through it during the course of this conversation so that we can give attention to our speakers, but rush away with it and uh, make sure many others have copies as you can. Uh, just to say before I introduce myself and one of two other remarks is to say up front, I'm sure you're aware that this is being recorded and therefore everything you say, every twitch you make, every inappropriate noise will be carried on the internet in perpetuity for uh, the next billion years. So just be, uh, be conscious <laughs> of that fact that it is truly on the record. I chaired something for Chatham House last year and I genuinely believed Chatham House was always Chatham House, but it was on the record, and so there we go. <laughs> That's a, oh, out <laughs> a little bit, but uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Michael Hastings. Uh, I have the glorious title of Lord Hastings of Scarisbrick CBE, and um, I'm a member of the Council of the Overseas Development Institute, but I suppose uh, besides the House of Lords, which is across the road and is an unpaid uh, little part of life, although a significant one, um, my paid work is with KPMG International, which, as I'm sure you all know, um, KPMG is the only audit, tax, and advisory firm in the world. And um, there are others who, <laughs> who attempt to step up to that position but don't quite get there. Anyway, I work for KPMG International, and my responsibilities are global citizenship, which sounds fantastic. So many people say to me, wish I could have a job being global head of citizenship and diversity. Sounds wonderful. What do you do? And uh, the answer to what I do is I promote particular areas of policy in things that matter to us as a business outside of the functions directly of auditing, providing tax consultancy and strategic advice to companies. So what are they? And let me read you the comments of our global chairman, Tim Flynn, um, who's based in New York. And just to give you a perspective, KPMG is a firm of 144,000 people in 140 countries. Uh, and $22 billion of revenue. So it's a significant employer and part of the global architecture of business. Our critical role as any audit, tax, and advisory firm is to ensure the credibility of the capital markets. It's to make sure that there is transparency, appropriate transparency in and for business, that the law is obeyed, and that we enable business and governments to function well and flourish well in order that they can do better for their stakeholders and their shareholders. But this is what our chairman wrote in a document on development, which is here. Many of the big issues facing the world today, population growth, climate change, globalization, poverty alleviation, technological change, food, water, and energy security, the spread of infectious diseases, all of them affect business. They certainly affect KPMG and its people who live and work in more than 140 territories around the globe. There isn't a place almost in the world where we don't have an office, 970 offices roughly around the world. And so we are touched and affected by what happens on these issues of fragile states. Today has been a particularly important day in that regard because besides chairing this event this afternoon, which I'm greatly looking forward to, um, I hosted a lunch today at the House of Lords for my former boss, a man called Michael Waring, who retired after 36 years from KPMG as the International Chief Executive, retired last September. And today, he received his CMG. Now, many of you are going to say, what's a CMG? Call me God. Call me God, exactly. <laughs> he did sainthood, sainthood. No, a CMG is Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. Most people understand MBE, OBE, maybe CBE, maybe knighthood, peerage. If you're in the military side, you get CMGs, Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. This is, this is the sheet, which uh, it was in a very fancy booklet, I can assure you, when he went to the palace this morning. And this is what he got it for. Services to the economic reconstruction and redevelopment of Iraq, especially in Basra. Now, I leave you to think to yourself, and I suggest to Alison you may be curious to have him come and speak. During the course of Gordon Brown's evidence to the Chilcot inquiry last Friday, Michael Waring is mentioned eight times. And this is what Gordon Brown said. 
So he said, so in effect, you and Michael Waring and others, or this was a question to him, uh, were to give a lead from outside, whereas re in reality by then the Iraqi government had been in power, Maliki's government, for quite some time. They should have had their own institutions in place rather than ours. And then Gordon Brown begins to answer about putting in place institutions for the future. And then he says this, Maliki was very keen on Basra development. I think in Iraq they have this strong sense that they can be a very strong country economically. But obviously it required, as you've rightly said, the push of some of our investors, and particularly Michael Waring, to get it moving. Well, in the text of the Chilcot Inquiry, Michael is mentioned eight times. What did he do? Leverage $14 billion of new investment for Basra to rebuild the social and practical infrastructure to provide jobs in an insecure and failing part of a state. So the issues are intrinsic to us as a business, intrinsic to how we think and believe. It's been part of a holistic part of my day, and I'm actually at the moment also personally reading this book, which was given to me for my 53rd birthday, which was a couple of months ago, Fixing Failed States. So you can see it's all on the mind at the moment. So with that in mind, let me turn to our speakers. We've got two main speakers and then two supporting speakers. And Alison is one of those, who, Alison Evans, who's the director of the Overseas Development Institute, and she will help us just to wrap up at the end. I just want to give you the obvious, tell you where the Toilets are. I hope you can find them if it's easy. Uh, the ladies' toilet is just outside the conference room, and the gentlemen's toilet are down the corridor to the right. So, kind of ladies that way, gentlemen kind of down that way, and around the corner. And if the fire alarm sounds well, you know what to do. <clears throat> Pass through the doors at reception downstairs, and then out onto Westminster Bridge Road. So, we've said everything we're going to say is on the record. This is of extreme significance to us all, we all know, and I don't say this flippantly, if we look at the fight to establish the peace in Northern Ireland, how difficult that has been. And that is not a failed state. And how intractable, how complex, how emotional, how passionate, how personable, pers personal, how significant it is to get these things of governance right in relationship to government and expenditure. If it's tough to do it in Northern Ireland, imagine what it's like to do it in the Sudan or anywhere else on the long list of countries you care to mention. Today in the House of Lords, we had a question um, this afternoon on the elections coming up in the Sudan fairly shortly. And those are issues that we were discussing just beforehand in our pre-conversation. So let's not look on the issue of failed states or states in complex situations with some kind of innate derision or wonder why they can't get it right. We struggle ourselves, even in our own context in Europe and in Great Britain and the United Kingdom, to fix these things appropriately. So